Right, hello, this is Jeff Scott of Black Hawk Technical College. I left off, uh, we're in Chapter 4 for the 152-153 Mobile Web, web Development uh, iOS class for the Spring 2014, 2015 sorry, semester. And I left off on the bottom of page 150. It says, uh, this is the way the app looks right now. And the author says, that's all fine, but we can do more if with just a little bit more work. It says, let's say that we've been struck by a great visionary idea where we want these two things up on the top, the upper left and the upper right, those labels to form like a header. So together they will take up the entire width of the screen. So that's what we do next. So the author says, we're going to create some constraints to make sure that our labels stay the same width as each other with tight spacing, etc. Figure 511 on the next page shows what we're looking for here or here. Okay. As mentioned down halfway down to the, the bottom of the page there on page 151, the author says the hardest part about this is being able to visual, visually verify that we've got the result we want. All right, so in the storyboard, it says we are to select both the UL and the UR labels, open the attributes inspector, scroll down to the view section, use the background control to select a nice bright color. Okay, so let's do that first. So they're both selected. There's the attributes inspector. We are supposed to select the uh, background, which I'm not seeing in here right now. The color, that color right there, I believe, is the color of the. Um, that is the color of the label itself, the text. So let's see. Maybe if we scroll down a bit in here, we'll see it. Whoops. Background, that looks a little better. Let's pick uh, light green. Okay. All right. It says, now direct your attention to the UL label and drag the resizing control on its right edge, pulling it almost to the horizontal midpoint of the view. You don't have to be exact here for reasons that will become clear soon. After doing this, resize the UR label the same way. All right. So, if I read that right, what he's saying is, we can close this. First, click on our UL label and bring it up to about where we consider it to be in the middle. Let me try that again. Again, we're just eyeballing it here and do the same thing with the UR label. And again, like I said, it probably isn't perfect and that's okay because as the author says here, we're going to change that in just a minute. Select both the UL and the UR labels. We've done this before. and then select Editor Pin Horizontal Spacing from Menu. That constraint tells the layout system how to hold these labels beside one another. 
build and run to see what happens, you'll probably see something similar to what you see in figure 512 <coughs> that is on page 152. So let's see. So I'm going to do a file save, and then let's run. This is the first time I've ran the simulator this morning, so again, sometimes it comes up right away and works great, other times not so much, so we'll see. What should happen is what's shown on here on page 152. The author shows the picture here and says, well, this is what we got. In fact, oh good, I used green and so did they. So it says that's pretty close, but not really what we had in mind. So what's missing? We've defined the constraints, but we haven't said anything about the size of the labels, which leaves the layout system free to size them the way they see fit. Make sure that the UL label is selected. Hold down on the shift key and click the UR label with both labels selected. From the menu, choose editor pin widths equally. So let's see if we need to do that. So... Again, I want to stop the simulator, start the run up again. And I'm not sure why this doesn't always come up and doesn't always work right away. There we go. So it does look virtually identical to what you see in figure 512 on page 152. All right, so let's stop the simulator. And what we're told to do back into our program again is to highlight the first label. Click it to... Okay, hold down on the shift key and click on the second label. And from the menu, select Editor Pin Widths Equally. And you can see below we get the orange lines, I think, that at least are showing what it's going to look like. You may also note that if the two labels weren't exactly the same width before, they certainly are now. You'll also notice that the constraints are colored orange. It means that the current positions in the storyboard do not match what you will see at run time. To fix this, do the Editor, Resolve Layout Issues, Update Frames, which it says should turn those to blue, and it does. If you run again at this point, you should be able to see that the labels are spread across the entire screen in both portrait and landscape orientation. So let's double check that. Looks good here, so let's do a hardware device, or a hardware rotate left, I should say, and see. Looks good there, too, as far as I can tell. So it says, in this example, all of our labels are visible and correctly laid out in multiple orientations. However, there is a lot of unused space on the screen. Perhaps it would be better if we set up the other two rows of labels to fill the width of the view or allowed the heights, etc., so move it around. It says, feel free to experiment. Apart from what we've covered so far, you'll find that the actions that create constraints in the editor pin menu, which we've already looked at at least a little bit in here, so let me quit the simulator.
and it says if you end up making a constraint that doesn't do what you want, you can delete it by selecting just the constraint and pressing the delete key. All right, that's it for this particular <coughs> uh, app that we've been working on. So I'm going to do a file, save, and a file, close project. And with that, I'm going to jump back into our book here. And we're still in here. We're going to start up a new project momentarily. All right. So the next topic, and really I believe the last one that's uh, discussed in this chapter, talks about creating adaptive layouts. Now, you may or may not remember this, but uh, one of the things the other day when I gave you, uh, I put a bunch of stuff out there in one of the in-class folders, I think for last week, but one of the things that was out there um, had a, a, a very long tutorial on creating adaptive layouts. So they mentioned some layouts work well when the device is in portrait mode, but not so well when it's rotated in landscape. And similar, similarly, some designs suit the iPhone, but not the iPad. Now, one thing to realize when you do this is that quite often when you work with an iPhone, the app will look really good in portrait mode but either won't be supported or won't look as good in landscape mode. Whereas with the iPad, which is a little bit more square in nature than the iPhone, the idea is it's supposed to look pretty much the same in both portrait and landscape modes. Now, they mention the book here down towards the bottom of 153. It says when you have this problem with something working in landscape and not in portrait or vice versa, prior to iOS 8, this meant implementing your whole layout and code or having multiple storyboards or a combination of the two. But with Xcode 6 and iOS 8, Apple has made it possible to, create, to design adaptive applications that work in both orientations and on different devices while using only a single storyboard. So... It says, to set the scene, we'll design, down here, we'll design a user interface for an iPhone in portrait mode, but it doesn't look so well when it's rotated or when it runs on an iPad. Then we'll see how to use the new Xcode 6 cool, tools rather to fix it so at least ideally it's going to look nice regardless of where, how, etc. we write it. So, we're supposed to start by making a brand new app. called restructure. So single view. Oops, I don't want to be caps. It says we're going to construct a GUI that consists of one large content area and a small set of buttons that perform basically fictitious actions. In other words, I don't think we're going to program the buttons. We'll place the buttons for now at the bottom of the screen and let the content area take up the rest of the space. So. We're told here on the bottom of page 154 to bring up the storyboard. It says, since we don't have an interesting content view to display, we'll just use a large colored rectangle. So we are to drag a single UI view onto our container view. So up here, and we've got right now for the iPhone 6. Let's change that, make it for a 4S. All right, and we'll come up here. UI view. We'll drag and we'll bring it in here. I like the way that worked, so I'm going to try that again. <coughs> it says you'll notice 
As you do so, it expands to fill the view container completely, which is not what we want. While it's still selected, resize it so it fills the top three quarters or so, and a small margin above it and to both sides. So. And I'm eyeballing this, but hopefully it's going to be fine. And we're told to have it take up about two-thirds of the screen. So this might be the hard one to do. Let's see, I wonder if I do this. that down if I'm able to drag that up. Kind of what I want here. All right, we're told we want it to take up about three quarters. All right, hopefully that's about okay. Next, switch over to the Attributes Inspector and choose a color. I choose green like I did before. Okay. It says they chose green, so from now on they're going to call it the green view. And drag a button and place it in the lower left empty space below the green view. Double click it and change it to action one, then option drag and make three copies so it looks similar to what you see in the book. Um, in fact, I'm going to knock this, bring this down just a little there. Okay, so I'm going to bring up my four buttons. some reason this isn't working very well. Okay, there's the first one we're making a copy of and we're supposed to call this action one Come on. this is supposed to be called action two Let's see if this is still lined up the way we want it to be lined up that looks good Looks good. That's supposed to be down just a tad. Kind of like that. All right. And I'm just going to drag two more of them out. Having too much trouble otherwise doing it the other way. So, action three. Finally, action four. All right. Far as I can tell now, this pretty much looks the way that it does in the book on figure 515 on page 155. says, now let's set up the auto layout constraints. Start by selecting the green view. 
We're going to start by pinning this to the top and to the left and the right sides of the view. That's still not enough to fully constrain it because its height isn't specified yet, but we'll fix that by anchoring it to the top of the buttons in just a minute. So collect, select the or click the pin button on the bottom of the screen. Remember the pin is right here, I believe at least. At the top of the pop-up, you'll see the now familiar group of four inputs. Leave the constraint to margins checkbox checked. Click the red dash lines above, to the left, and to the right. And we leave the one that's down below alone. All right, and click add three constraints. Okay, hopefully that fixed it. Now hold down on the shift key and select both the Action 1 and Action 2 buttons. Click the Align button, check Horizontal Centers in the pop-up, then click Add One Constraint. It's interesting, it gave me uh, two constraints. Okay, then do the same thing with the Action 3 and Action 4 buttons. <coughs> there I got only one constraint, so that's interesting. All right, hopefully I'm on track for where I should be. I'm on page, turning up now to page 156. Select the Action 2 button again and open up the pin pop-up. With Constraint to Margins checked, select the three red dash lines above, below, to the left of, above, and below. Then click Add Three Constraints. This constraints, these constraints fix the button in the lower left corner of the main view and set the vertical distance between it and the Action 1 buttons. The positions of both these buttons are now fully specified. Now do something similar with the other column of buttons. All right, so I'm going to add these constraints. Okay. So I'm going to click on the action four. Go to the pin menu, and this time I'm not going to choose the left, but I'm going to use the top, the right, and the bottom, and I'm going to add three constraints. All right, let's save this. And we're told to try to run the app. And they mention here in the middle of page 156, if you got all your constraints right, you should see something similar to, to figure 514. And if you rotate it, it should look similar to figure 516. 514 is on page 154, and 516 is on page 156. And hopefully it's going to come up. It says, this doesn't look too bad. The green size view prop resized properly, and we can see all the views. This arrangement might work, but we can do better. There's still a lot of white space at the bottom around the buttons. And the long green view might not look so good if it was an image view. Okay. 
It says either the image would be stretched or it'd be lost in the middle, depending on the properties of the image view. And how about the iPad? And they're saying that isn't going to look very good either. Now, this definitely does not look good. All right, let's do the hardware device or rotate left. No, those that definitely was not set up correctly. All right, so let's simulator. Let's quit the simulator. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with here. And in fact, I'm going to select all four buttons. And under Selected Views, I'm going to choose Clear Constraints. So they should all be gone now. And I'm going to try to reset them because, as you could see, at least as far as we could see, they were not they were not correct. All right. So go back and try it again. I think the green view was okay, so I'm not going to play with that one. I think everything was okay. So hold down on the shift key and select both the action one and action two buttons. Click the align button. Click or check horizontal centers in the pop-up. And then click add one constraint. Now I do have one where previously I had two, so hopefully that is going to help. This fixes these two buttons in a column. Repeat this procedure with the Action 3 and Action 4 buttons. So. So all that has been done. Select the Action 2 button again and open the pin menu. With the constraint to margins checked, select the red dashed lines to the left, above, and below. And check, click the Add 3 Constraints button. It says, these constraints fix this button in the lower left of the main view and set the vertical distance between it and the Action 1. Then we're told to click on the Action 4 button. Go to Pin. And this time we're supposed to select Above. to the right and below and add three constraints. All that's left is to fix the position of the bottom of the green view relative to the buttons. To do that, and I guess I didn't do this before, all right, control drag from the green view to the action one button. Very well, so let's try that again. Control drag. All right. In the pop up, select vertical spacing. It says that's all the constraints we need. If there are any warnings in the activity view, and I don't see any, but if there were, we could go 
and choose Editor Resolve Auto Layout Issues Update Frames. I don't see any, so I'm just going to try it like this. So I'm going to do a file, save, and I'm going to run the app and see if it looks better than it did last time. Looking a little bit better, I guess. The three could have been pushed over a little further, but at least as you can see, it looks better than it did look. So if we do a hardware, rotate left, same kind of thing. I guess that should have been pulled over a little more, but by and large, it looks pretty darn good the way it is right now. All right. So as mentioned on the bottom of 156, that doesn't look too bad, but we can do better, okay? They do mention also in the book on page 157, the author says here, if you were to run this on the, uh, on the iPad, it's probably not going to look really great either. Okay? Doesn't look terrible, but again, there is some white space, etc. All right, it says, this is a perfect example of a layout that needs to be modified for different screen sizes and therefore different orientations. We're actually going to create two extra variants of this layout, one that you'll use for the iPhone in landscape orientation and the other for the iPad. And they mention there on the next page, it says you can see what we're going to be aiming for on page 158. Okay, so that's going to be the iPhone in landscape orientation and then down below, that's the way that we want it to look on the iPad. All right, so as mentioned on the bottom of page 158 here, to create these two different layouts, we need two more sets of constraints. We can do that while still using only one storyboard thanks to a new iOS 8 feature known as size classes, which is what's discussed next. So as shown here on the bottom of page 158, it says take a look at the bottom of the storyboard editor. So let's move back into our, okay. It says, in the toolbar, you'll see something that we haven't mentioned so far. It's called the size class control. It looks like a label, and it's right there. It says WNE for width any and H any for height any. It says, click this control, and a pop-up containing a grid with nine cells will appear, as shown in figure 519 on page 159, or just you can see it on the screen right now. It says, we'll be using this control to help us create our two set extra sets of constraints, but first we need to explain what size classes are all about. And I'll try to remember because someplace I have, I think, a URL on size classes, so I'll try to put that out there too as soon as I can. All right. So as mentioned here by the author, I'm turning up to page 159 on the bottom of the page. It says the cells in the grid correspond to different combinations of horizontal or width and vertical or height size classes. A size class is a loose classification of the width or the height of a device. There are two concrete size classes, compact and regular, used to describe real devices, and a third, any, that can be used as a wild card, matching either compact or regular. Now this is a little bit different, so if we go back and we look here on the bottom of page 159, the author gives you a table down here on the bottom of the page. And it says this table shows the four possible combinations of concrete, horizontal, and vertical classes and how they map to devices and their orientations. Again, it's like anything else. This will probably only make sense 
when we start to really look at it and work with it. So, in general, compact implies something smaller than regular, but as it says, there's a couple interesting points to note. I don't want to read this. I'll leave it up there for just a second. Again, one thing to realize is there's quite a difference between portrait and landscape in an iPhone as opposed to portrait and landscape in an iPad. There's much less difference there. So, it says there, figure 520 shows a pictorial, pictorial representation of the information that was in the um, table that we saw on the previous page. So if we look here, and again, as I mentioned, I think this will only start to really make some sense when you start to work with it. So as mentioned on the bottom of page 161, it says, now that you know what size classes are, and let's not jump too far ahead of ourselves, now that we've been exposed a little bit to size classes, it says, let's return to the restructure application. Look again at size control in the storyboard editor. All right, so go back to here. All right, and let's bring this up again. By default, it's set to W any, H any. This means that the design in the storyboard editor applies to devices with any width and any height. All right, it says we'll refer to this as base design. You should always start out by creating the base design. Once you've done that, you can derive other designs you need by modifying the base design. You can modify the design to suit a particular combination without affecting the base design. That's what we're shooting for. All right, it says we already know that we need two additional designs for the restructure application. One for iPhones in landscape, the other for iPads. It says let's start by creating the landscape iPhone design shown at the top of figure 518, which was back on page 158. <coughs> so, First question to ask, what size class combination or combinations correspond to the layout that we're talking about? For all iPhones apart from the iPhone 6 Plus, that would be compact width, compact height, which translates to size classes, control of W compact, H compact. However, it says we want to use the same design for an iPhone 6 Plus, which maps to W regular, H compact. Putting those two together, we need to implement a design that works for any height, for any width and compact height. We can do this by using the pseudo class any for the width. So it says click the size classes control to open the pop up, which is what we just did. Then move your mouse over the squares in the grid. And as we do this, this starts to change, as you can see. All right, and what we want. we need to select the WNEH compact, all right, which corresponds, it's very interesting because I thought that's what I had on the screen right now, but it, mine is saying WNEH any, which corresponds to the leftmost two squares at the top row, okay, as shown in 521. The description at the bottom of the pop-up confirms that we have the correct selection. It says base values for all compact height layouts, example iPhones in landscape. All right. To actually make the selection, click the left, click the rightmost blue square in the grid. It says you'll see that the size classes control updates and the toolbar changes color to indicate that you're no longer editing the base design. The shape of the view controller area in the storyboard also changes to look more like a landscape iPhone. And that's what you see in figure 522, and you also see it on the screen. Now, it's a little different 
here as opposed to what's on the screen and I don't know why but my buttons are now in here and they're not shown in there so I'm not sure exactly what's going on it says there are three things you can do I'm on the bottom of page 163 there are three things you can do to modify the design for any given combination of size classes the changes you make apply only to devices and orientations that map to the current size combination. You can either add, remove, or modify constraints, or you can add or remove views, or you can change the font of some of the UI kit controls, such as UI label, UI text field, UI text view, and UI button for iOS 8. On the bottom of page 163, the author mentions the design that we're working with is so different from the base design that we'll need to remove all of the existing constraints since all of the views need to change position. Before we make any changes, open the assistant editor and select preview in the jump bar. and then open a preview of the storyboard showing the iPhone in portrait orientation. Now, I've been having nothing but problems trying to get that to show. All right, just so you're aware of that. So mine may not show a thing. It says, we'll use this preview to make sure that the changes we're about to make don't affect the base design. Well you know what, let's face it, what have we done on here that if for some reason we'd lose it, we'd really be in that much trouble? I don't think so. It says, let's start making the changes. In the storyboard, resize the green view so it's positioned on the left side of the main view, leaving room for the column of four buttons that we're going to build on the right. So in other words, what we want to do is come in here now, and on our green view, Looks good. Still not sure why this is way down at the bottom like this. I don't understand that, but it is. Now we need to move the four buttons in place. As it stands right now, you might find it difficult to drag the two buttons on the left, though I don't think I will. What we want to do basically is to take this first button, drag it up here, the second button, drag it about here, the third button, drag it somewhere around in here, and the fourth button, kind of like that. I think that's what we're told to do. Let me go back and check one more time. I think these are supposed to be that's supposed to be down a bit and up a bit that as well is supposed to be down a bit and I'm just eyeballing these, so they may not you know, be exactly where they're supposed to be. All right. All right, it says, Currently the green view and the buttons all have constraints that link them to one another and to the sides of the main view. We need to replace all of these constraints with new ones. You might be tempted to do this by selecting them in document outline and deleting them, but that would be a mistake. Deleting constraints removes them from the design of all classes. Instead, we want to uninstall them. So we're doing something different here. Select the Action 1 button in the storyboard and go in and open up the Size Inspector. 
says you'll find three constraints that are currently applied well, according to that I've got two of them but you'll find the three constraints currently applied to this button double click the top constraint to show the details see the right of figure 524 we need to uninstall the constraint for this design to do that press the plus button to the left of the checkbox and select any width compact height in the pop-up that appears this adds a new checkbox that applies WH WNE H compact layout only clear this checkbox to uninstall the constraint for this combination of size classes while leaving it installed for the base design. Well, what I have is definitely not what's being shown in the book. Let's try that again. Hopefully that did it. Now it's uninstalled. Back in the storyboard, you'll notice that the constraint disappears, and it's also grayed out in the document outline. Repeat this procedure for, the for all of the constraints attached to the four buttons and the green view. So... So as far as I can tell, I've done all of them. That's what they tell us to do here. All right. On the top of page 166, it says, now let's add the constraints we need for the new design, starting with a green view. It says we need to pin this view to the top left, right, and bottom edges of the main view. To do that, select the green view in the document outline. I'm going to have to stop for a couple minutes here. Alright, I guess I can keep going. So let's, alright, we need to pin this view to the top, left, right, and bottom edges of the main view. To, to do that, select the green view in the document outline. Alright, it's the one at the same level of nesting as the action button, so. Alright, I've got it. And click the pin. In the pop-up button, uncheck the constraint of margins. Then click the dash red lines above, below, and to the left, but not to the right. Above, below, and to the left, but not to the right. In the input fields above, below, and to the left, enter 20. And then click the add three constraints. So we want 20 here, here, and here.
All right, and then click the Add Three Constraints. To fix the right side of the green view, control drag from its center to the right until the main view's background turns blue. Release the mouse and click trailing space to container margin. and we want to choose trailing space to container margin. All right. Now we'll need to arrange the four buttons in a column, so drag them into roughly the layout that we need. Refer back to figure 518 as necessary. At this point, we can't make the buttons line up exactly in the storyboard because we don't have all the constraints we need. So continue to ignore all the auto layout warnings for now. Your layout should look similar to what is shown in figure 527 on page 167, and it does. All right, it says we now need to position the buttons horizontally and vertically. We'd like the buttons to be horizontally centered in their column and to be equally spaced vertically. There's no easy way to do that by applying constraints to the button using Interface Builder, because there's no way to say something like make this vert vertical gap between the two buttons the same as the gaps between the other buttons, which is what we really need. However, we can constrain the views to be of equal height, and that gives us a way to get what we need. We're going to add hidden filler views in the gaps between the buttons and force those hidden views to take up all of the available space and to be of equal heights. That's the same as making the gaps all the same size. We can use the same hidden views to center the buttons horizontally as well. We'll make the hidden views occupy all of the horizontal space and then make their centers and the centers of the buttons along the same line. All right, it says if, if you don't have a pretty clear of that view of that in your mind, it says let's take a sneak peek ahead at figure 528 to see exactly what we want to do. So if you look in the book at figure 528, as we're jumping up here, we're just about done with the chapter. That's what we want to do. Okay. And I'll tell you what, I've got about maybe seven or eight more pages, so I'm going to stop right now and then start up again in just a couple minutes.